Okay, good morning again. Here we are. Great to have you all. We're, we come now to the 11th chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, our 15th week, 15 out of 17. So just a couple of weeks left in our study of this great book in the Old Testament. And I think what we've found as we've seen this week after week is there's such a value to this book of wisdom. It comes to us in lots of um, and lots of word pictures and ways that we have to really study and think through what is the author saying here? What is he trying to communicate in such often poetic terms and allusions and things that we wouldn't necessarily understand without grasping historical context? And that's going to be true this morning as well. Our text this morning has a lot to say about working, about investing, and about trusting. And so, as we've seen throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, there's such a practicalness to this book. There's such just ways that we can go, oh, that I can instantly apply to my life. And so, as it says much about working, about investing, and about trusting this morning, it does so on this premise, and it's our big idea. It's not what you know, it's who you know, okay? As people of faith, we recognize that we come at life in a way from an angle that is different oftentimes than those who aren't people of faith. Other people do things regarding work and investing and trusting in ways that we don't, we don't come at it in that way. But we do, we do what we do according to the Word of God, not based solely on what we know, but on who we know. And that's what we're going to see as we work through this. Now, this passage, it's just six verses. This passage gives us some, it, it tells us explicitly, like very clearly, overtly, um, several things that we simply don't know. But it also then implies, tells us by implication, several things that we do know. And so I want you to listen to these or listen for these as I read the text. Ecclesiastes 11, starting in verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north in the place where the tree falls... There it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed, and at evening, withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. So, you've caught a few th phrases several times. We're told simply what we don't know. So, what did we see? We don't know what calamity may happen on earth. We don't know. Calamities, they may happen on earth, but we don't know what one. We don't know, that the, we don't know the way life begins in the womb. We don't know all the work of God. And we don't know which of our efforts will succeed. These are things that are explicitly told to us in this passage of Scripture. But then again, by way of implication, we're implying we can see the other side of that. While we don't know what calamity may happen on earth, what do we know? We do know that calamities happen on earth. We see it all the time. In our social media feeds, in the newspapers we read, online, in the news. Calamities happen all the time, and we know it. Some of us have experienced them. And so, we don't know, but we do know. We, we don't know the way life begins in the womb, but we do know that life begins in the womb. We don't know all the work of God, but we do know God is at work. We don't know which of our efforts will succeed, but we do know that God prospers the efforts of people. So based on what we don't know and what we do know, we are called to action based on 
who we know. Here God calls us to be wise and to make decisive decisions knowing that faith, again, we are people of faith, knowing that faith by definition means we simply don't know everything that there is to know. We don't act with full knowledge. We simply don't. And we know the Scriptures tell us that we won't because one Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, says we walk by faith, not by sight. Hebrews 11, 1 gives us a bit of a definition of faith, and it says now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so we know that we're called to be wise and decisive based on not full knowledge, but based on who we know. So let's look again at our opening verse as it calls us to work faithfully. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Now, as you read this passage of Scripture and you, we recognize there's some poetry taking place here, and so we begin to formulate a picture in our minds. Here it is. Here's this picture. There's a small lake in a very serene wooded setting. It's fall, so the leaves are coming down. Very colorful, beautiful. There's a bit of a mist over that lake. And here's a mom with her toddlers, and they all have their rubber boots on and their coats, and they're bundled up, and they've got bread in their hands. And there's some ducks off in the distance, and they're taking that bread, and they're breaking it up, and they're casting it into the waters. And of course, now the ducks are very interested. And if that's what you picture, you have no idea what this passage of Scripture means. <laughs> because that's not what's being communicated. Right? Remember, Ecclesiastes is wisdom literature, and so it comes to us by way of simile and metaphor and illusion. And what we have here is an illusion back to ancient days as to what used to take place. And this would go all the way back to the banks of the Nile River when the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. And every year that great river would rise and flood the land. And then as it would subside, all of the land around the Nile would be so soggy and watery and muddy. And the sower the farmer would go out with his satchel of seed and he would cast his seed or his bread upon the waters. And then he would take his livestock and he would walk his livestock throughout that land, trampling down the seed to get it into the ground. And after he'd cast his seed upon the waters, after many days, he would, what does it say? Find it. And he would find it in the form of a harvest. Beautiful, huh? Isaiah 32, 20 communicates this, and it says, Happy are you who sow beside all waters. Just a quick, just in case, I don't want to assume any, to sow here, S-O-W. That means to, to plant seed, to scatter and plant seed. It's not sow, S-E-W, like you would sow a hole in a shirt, okay? It's, you understand that Happy are you who sow beside all waters, who let the feet of the ox and the donkey range free. Right? So why are they happy? Well, because they have a harvest, because they've cast their bread upon the waters, and after many days they find it again. So casting your bread, of course, most of us, some of us are farmers, but most of us are not farmers, so is there application here for sure? Because, again, we've, we're able to take what's being communicated to us by way of an illusion or metaphor and say, how does this look in our lives? And for us, casting your bread is a metaphor for work. Those in an agricultural society understand this perfectly. They understand that if you want to eat, you have to plant seed in the ground and take care of it, and then it will grow up, and then you harvest that, and you have something to eat. They understand, and those who are farmers understand that where there will simply not be any reaping if there has not been any sowing. If you don't cast your bread, you won't have anything to find after many days. So we are to work in order to have food. It's the simplest principle under the earth. Again, the book of Ecclesiastes telling us the way life is 
on planet Earth. God has created seed time and harvest. God has created the seasons. God maintains and sustains life, and it's the way things are on planet Earth. We are to work in order to have food to eat. And if we don't work, and this might sound very challenging for some, but the way God has organized life under the sun is that if you don't work, you actually have no business eating. And that that might sound harsh, but the Scriptures tell us if a man is not willing to work, neither should he eat. And it's like this. God has built the human body to know when it needs food. We call it, we get hungry. And those hunger pains are actually God's built-in mechanism that gets us moving forward to do what we're supposed to do regarding work. So the hard part is if you feed somebody who's capable of working but simply won't, you're interrupting what God is trying to do in their life. Casting your bread is a metaphor for work, and casting your bread is an act of faith. Those in an agricultural society understand that entirely. They know that some of the very grain that they could consume, that they could make a meal out of and consume, is the very grain that they need to put back in the ground for the future. Instead of putting it into their mouths, they have to reinvest it. They have to, by faith, continue season after season to cast their bread upon the water. They know that if they consume everything that they have in the moment, they won't have anything in the future. And for those of us who aren't farmers but we're workers, we understand that casting our bread is a metaphor for work, and now we have to make that application where we understand that what we make from our work can't be all consumed in the moment, regardless of how much we make. We have to be diligent to put some of it back, cast some of it back, right? So faith is um, casting your bread upon the waters is an act of faith. So we cast our bread upon the waters when we work. Think about this, so simple, but we, we're casting our bread upon the waters, an act of faith when we work before we get pre- paid. When you work prior to getting paid, which is the way it is, it's an act of faith. We're casting our bread upon the waters. We get paid after we work, not before. That's understandable. Our paycheck, then, is the harvest that we find after having cast the bread of our labor in the prior pay period. This is just the way it is, life under the sun. So, in that case, work is an act of faith. When you go to work day after day, you're exercising faith in the way God has set things up on planet Earth Sowing and then reaping. When we plan for retirement, we're casting our bread upon the water. Every time we put money into an investment account rather than consume it in the moment, we're casting our bread in the hope of finding it after many days. It's an act of faith. And the next verses will tell us, spell that out even more completely. And also, we cast our bread upon the waters when we give to God's work. The Apostle Paul used some of this very same language when he was writing to the churches in the New Testament, this sowing and reaping. And he says this in 2 Corinthians 9. He says, he who supplies seed to the sower. Now, the he here, the the masculine pronoun he, is God. God is the one who provides or supplies seed to the sower. The sower here is us. We, human beings, are the sowers here. Notice, we're not simply consumers, but in God's economics, we're considered sowers. So God supplies seed to sowers, hoping that sowers will sow. His mind is that He supplies so that we would cast our bread upon the waters and not just consume it all ourselves. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, so notice it's both and, it's not just for consumption and it's not just for sowing, but it's for for both. It's both for our personal needs as well as to further God's work. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for what? For sowing. It doesn't say for consuming. 
obviously there's going to be consumption, but he's trying to teach us kingdom economics here. He's trying to teach us what Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. And that's the proper order. So he who supplies seed for sowing and increases the harvest of your righteousness. And then notice, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. So for a person of faith to not understand kingdom economics here is really an egregious error that needs to be learned and practiced because God will show Himself faithful. When we don't cast our bread upon the water by giving to the work of God, we're missing something greatly personally and the work of God is then suffering. So the, the personal part is that God has promised God is faithful and He's promised to meet our needs. And He's promised He wants to work through us to bless others, to care for others, to fund His work. He wants to work through us, showing that He's going to continue to increase our seed for sowing, but we have to do the sowing. It's not meant just for us. God God has never given us what we have simply for ourselves. It's for others too. And notice, last line, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. So generous sowers are the cause of much thanksgiving to God. Imagine being that. I mean, think about the gratitude that you would feel, the sense of satisfaction in your soul, knowing that other people are thanking God specifically for you. That's beautiful. This is exactly what Paul says. Cast your bread upon the waters, sow and reap. So our responsibility is to work. We get that. And those who know God work as an exercise of their faith in God, and so we work faithfully. Now let's look at our next set of verses. And here we're told to invest wisely. I love these verses. Don't you love these verses? We love these verses. He says, in investing wisely, give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain and they empty, they empty themselves on the earth, and if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. So, so we've got to tie these together. The harvest that we have from the bread that was cast upon the waters, is the, that's what's supposed to be portioned out in verse 2. Give a portion to seven or to eight. You take the harvest. You cast your bread, after many days you find it, you get this harvest, and then you take that harvest and you invest it wisely. You portion it out. Our first verse instructs us to work faithfully. Our second verse tells us to invest the harvest from our work wisely. So, what does the, the wisdom of the day tell us? The wisdom of the day tells us this, as we look at this passage of Scripture. It says, Diversify for security. Diversify for security. Right? So I've got three baskets of eggs up here. And I asked Rich, our sound booth technician, I said, now, is this little simple illustration, is this don't count your chickens before they hatch, or is this don't put all your eggs in one basket? Rich, I said, you've got a 50-50 chance. Rich, you were wrong. This is not don't count your chickens before they hatch, although that's wise counsel. This passage of Scripture tells us don't put all your eggs in one basket. Portion it out between seven or eight. And that's, that's not necessarily a specific number. It's trying to say make sure and diversify when you're investing. Because you could be walking along, and if you only, if you have all of your eggs in one basket, and you drop the basket, you have no eggs left. But if you have portioned it out, if you've diversified, and you're walking along, and a disaster happens, and you drop one of your baskets, you will cry over that, because that's a lot of eggs. But you are not destitute now, because you have diversified you still have some eggs. And this is the wisdom of the book of Ecclesiastes. Portion it out. Be wise in your investing. Right? That's what it tells us. We know that disasters happen. 
We don't know when they will happen. We don't know to whom they will happen, but we know that they happen. And given that reality, we are to diversify our investments. It's just that simple. There is inherent risk in every sort of investment, and so we have to limit that inherent risk through diversification. This is what the Scriptures tell us in saying, give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. So if you have a lot of money, don't keep, it in, don't keep all of it in one account. This is exactly what he's telling us. If you, inve- if you invest, don't invest all of what you're investing in a single company's stock. As you save for retirement, Don't keep all of your money with a single institution. This is what he's telling us. So we diversify. Look at verse 3. tells us to take action based on what we know. Though we're unable to predict the future, we, we know that God has set norms on planet Earth that we can count on. We just know it's the way it's going to be. None of us wondered whether or not the sun was going to rise this morning. We just know it's the way it is. God has set this norm. And when you look at verse 3, you think, what in the world is he talking about? If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth? And you go, yeah, no kidding. Like, we get that. When we see rain clouds, when we see rain clouds, when we, we don't have the rain clouds, okay, I won't do that in the second gathering. There we go. When you see clouds like this, we don't think, we know. It's like, grab your coat, put your hood up, it's coming. It's the way it is. God has set that norm in this world. This, this, this line, if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. We know this. When you see a tree, when you see a tree in the forest that's, that's, has fallen. You, it's not like 10 days later it's going to float up into the sky. You know wherever it falls, that's where it's going to lie. He's trying to tell us these are norms in life that you can count on. You don't know everything, but you take action based on what you do know, and you know God has set norms in this life. This is like, remember the last, last week the saying about the guy doesn't know his way to town? Like he's, he's a little slow. He doesn't, he's not playing with a full deck of cards. This is Solomon's words. It's like, these are no-brainers. You don't, you don't have to know your way to town to understand this. We get this. So what, what is it that we know? What do we know? Well, we know that interest compounds. We know that. We know it. It's, it we know that just like we know that there's rain in the clouds when they're heavy like that. So, so we know the old saying of a penny saved being a penny earned. Well, when you talk about the compounding nature of interest, that saying is true. A penny saved is actually a penny earned because interest is making you money now. Your money's earning money for you then. And you know that just like you know when a tree falls to the south. It's not going gonna, it's, it's to float up into the sky later. Interest compounds. We know that. We, what else do we know? We know that get-rich-quick schemes are schemes, and they should be avoided. And we have tons of warnings in, our, in the wisdom literature of the Bible about that. What else do we know? We know that investments that seem too good to be true probably are. They probably are. And we know that God honors those who honor Him. We know that just as sure as we know that the clouds are heavy with rain when they're dark. Right? We know it. We know it. And given, given the chances of disaster... Our natural inclination, very natural for all human beings, is to hoard what we have, whether it's little or much. Our natural inclination is to hoard it, but we've already learned from Ecclesiastes 5 that hoarding itself is a bad venture. It's not the way for people of faith. And when we hoard, as I said several weeks ago when we looked at that, it proves two things. One, we don't understand God's economics. When we get afraid and we hoard, we're saying we really don't understand God's economics. But the other thing we're saying is we really don't trust God for our future well-being. Right? But friends, He's faithful. 
Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So take action based on what you know. And the third thing we see in verse 4 is to not be paralyzed by what we can't control. Don't be paralyzed by what you can't control. He who observes the wind. Anybody control the wind? Nope. But if you, if you observe the wind, you think, ah, oh, maybe it's a little too windy. I better not cast my seed today. Maybe it's, maybe it's you know, he who observes the wind, he who regards the clouds. Ah, it might rain. Ah, it might do this. And so at, at some point you get paralyzed and you can't make any decisions because you can't control the whole world. And he says, no, don't be paralyzed by what you can't control. We should not allow what we don't know to keep us from acting on what we do know. There's never going to be an ideal time. This passage of Scripture is meant to bolster our faith, to recognize that we have responsibilities, that, to recognize that there's risks in this life, and there's rewards also. Right? So we can't let ourselves be paralyzed by this. There will always be some reason for us not to act, and Solomon says, act. Doors that are open do eventually close. Somebody said that the opportunity of a lifetime must be realized within the lifetime of the opportunity. And so we must recognize that we, we are to invest wisely, but sometimes some people think wise means no risk, and that's not, that's not what we get in Scripture. Amen? Amen? So our text gives us this confidence that we can work faithfully and we can invest wisely. And it's all on the confidence. All of that confidence is founded on who we know. And we are to trust completely. Verses 5 and 6, our last two verses. You do not know, as you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones of the womb, of, in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. So in the morning, he says, sow your seed. And at evening, withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. So we trust completely. We trust God. Notice the word as, the very first word of verse 5. As you do not know, so you do not know. He's making this comparison again. And it's interesting because in these days, this is several thousand years ago, this is being written, and of course, they knew the act that produced life in the womb. They understood the sexual act that takes place, and a woman would become pregnant, a baby would be in her womb. They understood that, but they, beyond that, they really had no idea how life begins in the womb. But if you advance now to the year 2019, and all of the incredible medical technology and the things that we know, remarkable knowledge, and yet in all of that, we still don't. We st it's, there's still a massive amount of mystery in how in the world does life begin in the womb. And we know it begins in the womb. And so here he's making this comparison. As you do not know that, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. We, we simply cannot comprehend everything that God does. There is a mystery to it, and we will, it will remain a mystery. We can understand and know God better and better as we mature in our walk with Christ, as we, as we learn the principles of the Bible and live them out. We can learn to know God, but we will never know the work of God entirely. His ways are beyond tracing out. There is a mystery that God has purposefully left in place under the sun, and we should learn to relish it and not to dread it. We should learn to trust because we do not know the work of God, yet we know God. And that's the key, friends. This is where He wants us. He wants us to recognize our limitations, but to recognize that we know Him. We know Him. And just because we don't know all of His workings doesn't mean we don't know Him. I think about it with, with, my, ch with my children, my, especially when my children were younger. They didn't know why I did what I did. 
They didn't know why I said yes to some things and no to other things. They didn't know why we put boundaries around some things and had free reign over other things. They could not comprehend that. And even still, they, don't, they still don't fully comprehend that. But they know me. Right? And, and this is, in, in a far great magnified way, this is what, this is what God wants us to know. We, we're not going to understand why he says yes and no to certain things. We're not going to understand why there's boundaries and why there's free reign over certain things and not other things. We're, we're not going to understand why he works the way he works, but we know him. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 100, and it just gives such a, such a full and apt description of who God is. For the Lord is good. It's, it, see, see, you and I, we, we try to be good. We, we strive to be good. We want to be good. God does not try to be good, friends. God is good. The Lord is good. It's an inherent part of His character. It is inseparable from who God is at the very core of His nature. God is good. And His steadfast love endures. Steadfast love is a, is a, um, it's a love that is loyal. It's loyal. And it endures. And his faithfulness to all generations, right? So we get this beautiful picture of who God is. The Lord is good. He's inherently good. He loves us eternally. He's internally loyal to us. And he's faithful to every generation under the sun. And it's based on who we know. Not what we know. Who we know that we do what we do. We know Him. So we don't know all the work of God, but we do know God so we can act with boldness. We can act boldly. God, He makes everything. That's what we're told. He makes everything. He's in control of everything. He is our Father, and He has promised to care for us. And friends, we should know this. This is that trust completely. This sort of knowledge of knowing who God is emboldens us to step out in faith, to take some risk, to, to, to take bold action and to work hard and to be faithful in what we're doing because we know Him. We don't have to have absolute certainty over the things that, are, that we're debating and praying about. We don't have to have absolute certainty. That wisdom part is necessary, but we don't have to have absolute certainty because we're people of faith. We're not going to know everything, but we, can have, but we serve an absolutely faithful God. He is certainly faithful, right? So, he says, in the morning, sow your seed. Sow your seed. Cast your bread. At, in the evening, withhold not your hand. Keep doing it. Keep acting boldly. Keep walking by faith. Keep exercising your faith in the things that you're doing in life. The responsibility to act is ours. The results, the outcomes are God's. And we don't know what's going to prosper. We don't know which of our efforts is going to succeed. How many business ventures were started by, with, a, with a plan and faith and then Six months or 18 months into it, the thing takes a left turn. But where the left turn takes them is right where they needed to be, but God used the first, first six months or the first 18 months to get them to the left turn. And had they not done that, they would never have gotten to the turn. And this is life. We don't know everything that's taking place. We don't know with certainty all of the things that are going on and things happen in our lives and we think, dear God, what are you doing? Sometimes we think, are you doing anything? And it's not easy to trust completely. I personally, <laughs> I personally have to wrestle with this myself. But the scriptures call us to it. The scriptures, the scriptures in, the, in the work of the Holy Spirit are, are, are to, to embolden us to say, yes, I'm walking with Jesus. I can do this. God's leading me. I don't know everything, but I know Him. Right? I can do this. We can do this. We can trust completely. We can act boldly. The responsibility to act is ours. The outcomes are God's. 
We don't know what's going to prosper, but we know, we know God prospers the efforts of His people. It may not look like we predicted, but if we're walking by faith, who cares? Because we trust. We trust Him. So we can work faithfully, invest wisely, and trust completely because of who we know. So the teacher says, ignorance is no excuse for inaction. You don't know everything, but that doesn't mean you should be passive. He says, waiting for ideal conditions is not ideal. He says, procrastination leads to paralysis, and he concludes by saying, doing something is better than doing nothing. And you could say amen. So we're, we're, we're limited. We're so very limited. We, we don't know much. We can't predict the future. We're not really in control. And Solomon says it's wise to remember what you don't know, which is pretty much everything. But he says it's wiser still to remember who you know. Who you know. Because it's not what you know. It's who you know. Now we're going to make some application. We work on ways to respond because we want to be doers of the word and not hearers only. But I want to bring it, I want to bring it to eternal matters for each one of us, but in particular for those of you who are here today who do not know God by way of personal faith relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's Son. He is the eternal, divine Son of God who came to earth from heaven and who lived that perfect life that none of us have lived. He died a substitutionary death in our place because the wages of sin is death and we all have sinned. Jesus took our sin and the sin of the whole world upon Himself, died bearing our punishment, and then conquered our enemies by coming back to life. And, he's, and the Bible tells us that if we will trust Jesus, if we will confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. We will be saved from the consequences of our sin and saved to eternal life. So this passage of Scripture doesn't... It actually kind of doesn't have a whole lot to say about eternal matters. It's very practical, earthy things. Except when we talk about the work of God. When we, the work we do is really important stuff, and we've seen that. But the work that Jesus has done is even more important. Mm -hmm. And so I would say it like this. When it comes to investing, don't put all your eggs in one basket. But when it comes to eternal life, when it comes to salvation, Jesus is the only basket. <laughs> Don't diversify. When it comes to Jesus, when it comes to eternal matters, when it comes to salvation and being reconciled to God, don't diversify. At one point, somebody asked Jesus, what, what is the work we can do that God would approve of? And Jesus said, the work that God approves of is to believe in Him whom He has sent. Jesus is the one God has sent. He's the only one that has bore our sins. Others have said wise things. Others, others have said things that are smart. But there's nobody else that has bore our sin and conquered our enemies. So, with regard to investing, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And Rich, don't count your chickens before they hatch. <laughs> but when it comes to Eternal matters. Jesus is the only basket, friends. Put your trust in Jesus. Be reconciled to God. If that's a decision that you're prepared to make, I would love for you to just note that on your connection card. And we would love to follow up with you and help you in that. So, ways to respond. First way is, I want to know God. If you're saying, I want to know God and I'm ready to trust Jesus for my eternal well-being, mark that on your connection card. Other ways to respond. Some of you would say, I need to embrace God's command to work. And there's kind of two ways to look at that. One is this idea that, that there may be some who just simply don't work. 
but you're capable of it. And the command from God is work. Find work. Pray to God, ask Him to help you, and find work. Another way to look at that is, is some of you have just been chafing in your, in your soul. You've been chafing against work. You're doing it because you know you've got responsibilities, but you don't like it. And the book of Ecclesiastes has given us several times throughout this study to enjoy work as a gift from God. So ask Him to help you to embrace work as something that is a blessing from God. Help him, ask Him to help you with your perspective. Another, some would say, I need wisdom in my investments. That's a way you could respond. For others, you need to start giving to the work of God. This, the work of City Point Church, the work of God through the local church, it, it only happens because faithful, generous people give and serve. I was thinking about this the other day. What if, what if everybody gave but nobody served? Well, if everybody gave and nobody served, we could do very little because the church runs on volunteers. But the other side of that, what if everybody served and nobody gave? Well, we wouldn't even exist. So some of you, week in and week out, you benefit from, you serve in the ministry of the church, but, but you, you, haven't, you haven't been trusting God in this way. So start. Start somewhere and start. And for others, you need to step it up. God has blessed you. See yourself as a sower. Be a sower. Be a generous sower. Be a cause for thanksgiving. And watch God bless you. And watch Him continue to bless the church. So, lastly, last way to respond is a fill in the blank. And I'm not going to give you the fill in. I'm stepping out in faith, trusting God in. What is it? What is it? Oh, yeah, there's risk and maybe it'll make you nervous. That's kind of fun. That's kind of exciting. And I know you got to pray through it and you got to ask for wisdom and you got to seek counsel and you got to do all that. But at the end of the day, you got to make a decision. So what is it? Have you been, has God been prompting you with something? Has God been speaking to you? And you think, man, that's, that's a big step. Yeah. Yeah, read the Bible. It's full of big steps. Like everybody that's ever done anything has taken a big step. A lot of big steps usually start with a little step. So what is it? What's your fill in the blank? What's your fill in the blank? Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for this.